Welcome to Lunch Bums. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to the staff of the Morrison Library, to the University Libraries as a, as a body, and to Noah and Owen from Moe's, who have books for after the reading. Um, just a few brief notes. There is an email list over on the counter over there. If you're not on our mailing list, please sign up. You'll also find posters, if you're so inspired, featuring the rest of our readings for this year. Um, next up, on December 5th, will be Margaret Ross, Berkeley Zone. Um, <laughs> you can also, if you're so inspired, find us on YouTube, uh, where we have our own channel to review this reading and all our past readings. Um, and finally, please silence your phones if you haven't already. And here is our director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce the illustrious Monica Yoon. Thank you. Thank you, Noah, and thank you all for being here. And thank you to this brilliant poet, Monica Yoon, for coming here today and speaking or declaiming or singing to us. Um, I'm going to start, unfortunately, in the way that just about every review of this book starts, which is by defining Blackacre, which um, the poet also has generously done in the back of the book. So I think it was first deployed in 1628 um, as a kind of fictional piece of real estate that would be at issue in a hypothetical legal case. So it's sort of doubly um, hypothetical in that it's only part of um, exemplary legal actions and it is itself fictitious, which means that it's basically irreal estate rather than real estate. Um, and I'm gonna use that as my incredibly clumsy segue into the thinking about poetry that's happening in a book with that title. Because I think, although there are plenty of um, things problematic about saying this, poetry might also be a form of irreal estate a form of material structure and something to which we would lend metaphors of spatiality and maybe even of possession, even though it occurs nowhere on Earth. So if a black acre is the John Doe of Earth, then maybe the poem is the John Doe of unearth. Um, and I think that that kind of work with the fake or only partially real or only formal spaces of poetry um, is happening formally in this book in many ways. Um, Monica has always been a master of enjambment. I think enjambment is a really wonderful way of thinking about both possession and dispossession and space and non-space, right? There's this nothingness on the right margin between lines of poetry in verse that determines our sense of the somethings that are on either side of that nothing. There are many poems in this book that have severe breaks between the sort of moments of self-possession that we could think of speaking in lines as being. In fact, there are lots of moments that seem to be both about desire for something and an inability to access desire and enjambment at, at the very same time. I just flagged a couple of them. Um, as if by sweeping outward, your hands could draw subsistence substance from the horizontals of the ground, as if these motions touching nothing were still enough to feed you. One way to produce the heresy of paraphrase around that is to say that the nothings in poetry are substantial nothings, and that they can produce things that tend towards sufficiency or even nourishment, even though they're also deeply not there. A um, couple of other ones like that, and then we'll actually hear the poet declaim. Um, okay. It must rest its attention outward and downward towards sufficiency, right? That's, that's the motion of poetry and the motion of reading poetry, outward and then downward again and again. Lastly, I want to speak to content. Um, although Blackacre denotes a fictive possession of a plot, a real estate plot, um, if you don't know what the term means and, and you just think it's component parts, it's a bizarre combination of um, the imagination of tillage, of, of a space of cultivation, and a space of um, void or nothingness or burntness. It's a little bit like the doubling of the wasteland in Eliot, which is both wilderness and the place where nothing can grow. And again, I think that's a lot like what um, poetry's value and procedures can be, in that it both is nothing and yet it is productive at the same time. Um, 
Monica is also a poet of constellative brilliance. She's always troping in ways that are multifarious. She's interested in growing poetry via doubt rather than by conclusion. She does not reconcile. She simply produces the frictive energy of making things mismatch and leaving it to the, as the burden of the reader to keep moving outward and downward only towards sufficiency rather than into any resting state. Let's hear some of that unrest. Welcome, Monica. Thank you so much for that glorious introduction, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you, Noah. Thank you to the library and all of you for showing up here for Lunch Poems. I'm so excited to be reading here. I was actually born in Berkeley. My, uh, my father was Berkeley class of 1965, so, you know, go Bears. Um, <laughs> Anyhow, I thought, um, you know, I always like to get a sense of the room before I um, start reading, and I thought I'd kind of reverse my usual order and start with the sort of long title sequence for the book, uh, which is, uh, it's kind of based on that, uh, there's a Milton sonnet that I was asked to memorize by a high school teacher when I was about 15, and it's Milton's famous sonnet on his blindness, and it goes, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, if I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days, in that that dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker, and present my true account, lest he returning chide, doth God exact day labor light denied, I fondly ask, but patience to prevent that murmur, soon replied, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts, who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some nods around the room. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a poem that was always a source of comfort to me. It was what I would recite while I was, you know, waiting for the subway, for instance. It's very thematically appropriate to that. Uh, but then I had this experience of infertility. I was diagnosed with premature ovarian failure uh, when I was in my late 20s. And uh, this came to a head when I thought it was fixable, was not fixable, went through this kind of, kind of long ordeal of fertility treatments. And um, I found that the poem changed for me, that these words like prevent, and chide and spent and denied would kind of loom up out of the poem so that it ceased to be a source of comfort for me. And so I was trying to write this title poem to give voice to that and also using the idea of black acre. Black acre is a trope for particularly the female body, which in its roots in property law, you know, if John Doe wants black acre to pass down to John Doe Jr., the mechanism for that transaction is the body of Jane Doe and he has to ensure that Jane Doe is faithful and that Jane Doe is fertile. And so this whole range of both legal and social control spring up around the female body to protect that property transaction. You know, both, you know, things like, of course, inheritance, marital property, the entail, divorce laws, all of, um, you know, infidelity laws, but also things like, you know, uh, reproductive freedom issues and the stigmatization of women who are aging, women who are infertile, women who are unfair faithful from, uh, from Eve to Anne Boleyn, right? To, uh, from Lilith to Anne Boleyn to uh, Miss Havisham to the Cougars, right? Um, and so this was kind of trying to speak to a lot of that. Um, so uh, let me start with, you know, you'll recall from the sonnet, Milton is kind of bemoaning his state. And then Patience shows up at the turn of the sonnet and sort of takes over the poem. Um, and the way I wrote the poem, it's in 14 sections. Each is responding to one of the end words of the sonnet. Uh, so this one is... Um, prevent. Uh, once patience shows up, Milton doesn't get another word in his own poem, which I always thought was interesting. Pre um, but patience to prevent that murmur. Pre eight, prevent. Prevent a word like a white sheet folded back to cover the mouth. A white egg burst from the ovary and falls away, leaving a star-shaped scar. Corpus albicans the whitening body. Such starbursts at first are scattered constellations, frost embroidering a dark field. But at what point does, that white does this white lacework shift over from intricacy to impossibility, 
opacity obstacle, the ice disk clogging the round pond, the grid of proteins baffling the eye. Prevent, a word that slams shut, a portcullis, Latin, cataracta. Letter to Leonard Falaris, September 28th, 1654. The dimness which I experience night and day seems to incline more to white than to black. Nine, need. Has patience been looming in the background all along, silent so as not to intrude upon the blind man's consciousness? Patience, whose garment is white and close-fitting so that it is not blown about or disturbed by the wind. At the turn of the sonnet, patience pries open its sculpted lips, its stiff tongue like a weaver's shuttle, drawing woolly strands through the warp and weft of Milton's blindness, a white monologue that admits neither interruption nor rejoinder. Milton's little murmur stitched back into his mouth. Woven tight enough to repel need, a liquid beating on the surface, the blood the needles drew from me week after week, hundreds of stoppered vials consigned to the biohazard bin en route to the incinerator. Need from the high German for danger. Murmur from the Sanskrit, a crackling fire. Um, and then I'll read a couple from the, um, from the end, um, thousands, at his be thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean uh, or land and water without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. 13, rest. Rest, a word like a gauze bandage, a ropey weave of collagen knitting its way across a wound. Outspread as if fingered, gelid gestures suggesting so solace to stanch, to shield, to seal, to shut off. Rest, the rind of the best, a contoured pod that cradles the shape of what it doesn't hold. Rest, those who are left when thousands have sped away, the bereft who litter the land with husks for hands, vacant eyed, vacant faces raised like basins under the contrail scarred sky. 14, wait. To stand and wait is a task far weightier than simple waiting. It is to permit the distractible body neither ease nor action, nor food, nor drink, nor any such reprieve it is to pit the body in enmity against its own heaviness. To abide in readiness as in a winter orchard, the lacerated land bandaged in snow. To exist inert as if limbless, skin seamless as if re-knit over what had been pruned away, knotted rootstock fit for no other service, no branch, no leaf, no fruit. To persist as a stripped stick persists in a white field, bark peeled back from one exposed split, up tilted as if eager for the grafted slip. Mercy sugars the starving soil with nitrogen, potassium, phosphate. Mercy captures rain in silver beads and stitches them through the threadbare weave of cloud. Mercy wields a scalpel, cutting a cleft in the lopped off stump. Mercy forces home the rootless wand. Mercy seals the join with tar and tape. To foster the raw scion as if it were a sun, to siphon light down through its body as if it were your own. Um, and I thought I'd read something lighter before diving back into something heavier. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm doing okay for time. So um, this um, this one is. Um, uh, a poem that's based on an urban legend that was current at my junior high school about Twinkies, the base baked goods. Uh, you know, Twinkies, uh, so it was said, and this was pre-internet, um, so you couldn't check this stuff, uh, that Twinkies the, were not actually baked. They were this kind of goo that was extruded onto a plate and then kind of exposed to a chemical catalyst so that they foamed up and grew kind of this golden <laughs> outer layer on top of the gooey inner layer. Um, and I believed this for years. Um, Twinkie in my junior high school was also an uh, epithet for people who are yellow on the outside and white on the inside. Um, and I thought, um, you know, this particularly came to mind um, in the sort of 
uh, rhetoric of white nationalism uh, uh, because um, the poem is written in the subjunctive um, uh, and the subjunctive in English uh, this is the way in which you express unreality or irreality or fantasy um, and what's interesting about its construction is it's often indistinguishable from the past tense so you are becomes as if you were um, and I thought that it was interesting that we like to cloak our our fantasies or our unrealities in trappings of pastness. Uh, and particularly that might be true when it comes to race. Uh, this idea of, you know, Aryanism has that gesture, uh, gone with the wind has that gesture, make America great again. What is the value added by the again in make America great again, right? Um, and uh, so if you look at the poem in the book, there's a, a series of as ifs, and there's a series of statements that most of which uh, that read as if they're in the past tense without the as if, but the as if converts them into the subjunctive. Goldacre. As if you were ever wide-eyed enough to believe in urban legends, as if these plot elements weren't the stalest of cliches, the secret lab, the anaerobic chamber, the gloved hand ex machina, the chemical infused fog. As if every origin story didn't center on the same sweet myth of a lost wholeness. As if such longing would seem more palatable if packaged as nostalgia. As if there once had been a moment of unity, smoothly numinous, pellucid, as if inner and outer were merely phases of the same substance. As if this whiteness had been your original condition. As if it hadn't been what was piped into you, what seeped into each vacant cell, each air hole, each pore. As if you had started off skinless, shameless, blameless, creamy as if whipped, passive as if extruded, quivering with volatility in a metal mold. As if a catalyzing vapor triggered a latent reaction. As if your flesh foamed up, a hydrogenated emulsion consisting mostly of trapped air. As if, though sponge-like, you could remain shelf-stable for decades, <laughs> part embalming fluid, part rocket fuel, part glue. As if you had been named twin, a word for likeness, or wink, a word for joke, or ink, a word for stain, or key, a word for answer. As if your skin oxidized to its present burnished hue, golden, as if homemade. Um, and I'll read, uh, this one's also working off another text. Um, this is based on uh, Peter Pan. You know, I was also thinking in my thinking around infertility of why is it that, you know, because there's a medical condition, which is a problem, but what is the shame that surrounds infertility, the personal shame that so many women feel? You know, women come up to me after readings and they're, they're always whispering and they say, I had a miscarriage. Or they say, I, I, can't, I can't have children. My husband and I have been trying. And they are made to feel personally ashamed the way that they, you would not be about another medical condition, right? Um, and so, and so much of that is in the stories about what we tell our little girls about who they are and what they're worth, what they're there for. So uh, this is from, um, this is based on um, Peter and Wendy, the uh, Peter Pan, uh, which is, if you read the original, the J.M. Barry, um, it's kind of this beautiful and sinister book. The, uh, the Lost Boys are waiting in Neverland for Wendy, this little girl who they desperately want to be their mother. And at one point, it's explained that they build this little house for her to entice her to stay. Um, and the house is made out of these red vines. And so it's kind of oozing this sticky red sap. So they build this kind of like red, veiny, oozy, sticky looking house for this little girl and it's kind of like all right symbolism uh, you decide um, red acre uh, so the epigraph is from Peter and Wendy of course slightly was the first to get his word in Wendy lady he said rapidly for you we built this house oh say you're pleased cried Nibs lovely darling house Wendy said and they were the very words they had hoped she would say and we are your children, cried the twins. Then all went on their knees and holding out their arms cried, Oh, Wendy lady, be our mother. Ought I, Wendy said, all shining. 
Of course, it's frightfully fascinating, but you see, I am only a little girl. I have no real experience. In a scheme to entice her, they fashioned a shrine with jewel work of berries, with cruel work of vines, red mullions flaunting flocked velvet drapes, rose-pattered carpets in plush-piled heaps. At the pulsating heart of this upholstered nest, a snug seat like a socket that whispered of rest. But I can't be your mother. I'm not ready yet and the eaves of the little home slumped with regret, and its sorrow turned inward, turned acid, turned foul, and corrosion traced stencils and slime on the wall, and the draperies puddled in ponds on the floor, and the overripe cushions ruptured like sores. The seat melted to nothing. A hollowed-out void drained away everything in a purgative flood, more taboo than urine. An effluvial flow streamed toward the sewers, a liquefied no. Wide-eyed and wide-mouthed, she gaped in dismay as pearl-like the possibles went floating away. Uh, and one more from... Uh, Blackacre. This is a a poem that's uh, is the other title to the poem is short. Uh, it's an ekphrastic um, on um, on the sonogram of what turned out to be my last viable egg, Blackacre. One day they showed me a dark moon ringed with a bright nimbus on a swirling gray screen. <clears throat> they called it my last chance for never ending life, but the next day it was gone. It had already launched itself into the gray sky, like an escape capsule, accidentally empty, sent spiraling into the unpeopled galaxies of my trackless gray body. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to turn to new work. Um, I've been working on these longer poems that are all called Study of Two Figures, uh, or this one sequence I'm doing. This one requires some context. Um, so it centers, obviously, uh, obviously on two figures, uh, one of which will be familiar to many of you, Pasiphae from classical uh, Greek mythology. Uh, she was the wife of King Minos of Crete. And what happened is the god sent a white bull from the sea, and her husband, King Minos, was supposed to sacrifice the bull uh, to the gods, and instead he kept it for his own herds. And the gods call, caused Pasiphae to fall in love with the bull. Uh, so she, hired, she got the in inventor Daedalus, who was then working for them uh, to make her a mechanical cow, a wooden cow. And so she gets inside the cow and she crouches there and waits and is impregnated by the bull. She then gives birth to the minotaur, which is imprisoned in the labyrinth, also made by Daedalus, and uh, who is later killed by the hero Theseus. Also relevant to this um, is that Pasiphae is Asian. She is, uh, she is from uh, Colchis in Turkey, and she is, um, she is related to that family of witches. Uh, Circe is a relative, Phaedra is a, well uh, is a relative, um, Medea is a relative, all of those, uh, all of those witches out of Colchis. Um, and then um, the other figure is Prince Sado uh, from uh, Korean history. He's an 18th century Korean crown prince. And um, so he's crown prince. He marries this amazing woman named uh, Lady Hyegyong. And, uh, and they have a child who is then the, you know, the, the heir to the throne, a male heir. Um, and then Sado goes, for whatever reason, uh, insane. Um, and his insanity took many forms, uh, uh, part of which was homicidal. So he, uh, he raped and killed probably about a hundred courtiers. Um, and because he was the crown prince, there was nothing that could be done about it, really. Um, and uh, um, he could not be uh, condemned as a criminal because to do that would taint the succession so that his son would also not inherit. He could not be, uh, he could not be declared insane. Uh, for the same reason, this left the king, his father, in a dilemma. So what the king did uh, was, he, on a July day in Seoul, he, um, he ordered Sado to appear before him and to apologize for his crimes, which Sado did. And the king ordered a rice chest to be brought. A rice chest is a box. It's about four foot by three foot by four foot, maybe. Um, just holds rice. Um, and um, 
He ordered Sado to get into the box. Sado did. The king closed the lid and about, uh, ordered grass to be put on top. And about eight days later, Sado died. St huh? That was okay. Yeah, that was, yeah, that, that was apparently fine, according to the king's terms. <laughs> Study of two figures, Pasifai Sado. <clears throat> One figure is female. Sorry, glass of water before I start. <clears throat> there we go. One figure is female, the other is male. Both are contained. One figure is mythical, the other historical. To the extent that they can be said to have existed at all, they occupy different millennia, different continents. But to the extent that one can be said to have existed at all, both figures are considered Asian, one from Colchis, one from Korea. To mention the Asian-ness of the figures creates a racial marker in the poem. This means that the poem can no longer pass as a white poem, that different people can be expected to read the poem, that they can be expected to read the poem in different ways. To mention the Asian-ness of the figures is also to mention by implication the Asian-ness of the poet. Revealing a racial marker in a poem is like revealing a gun in a story or like revealing a nipple in a dance. After such a revelation, the poem is about race. The story is about the gun. The dance is about the body of the dancer. It is no longer considered a dance at all and is subject to regulation. Topics that have this gravitational quality of aboutness are known as hot button topics, such as race, violence, or sex. Hot button is a marketing term coined by Walter Kitchell III in a September 1978 issue of Fortune magazine. The term evokes laboratory animals and refers to consumer desires that need to be slaked. The term hot button suggests not only the slaking of such desires, but also a shock or punishment for having acted on those desires, a deterrent to further actions pursuing such desires, and by extension, a deterrent to desire itself. Violence and sex are examples of desires and can be satisfied, punished, and deterred. Race is not usually considered an example of desire. Both the female and the male figures are able to articulate their desires with an unusual degree of candor and specificity. Both are responsible for many sexual deaths. The male figure says, when anger grips me, I cannot contain myself. Only after I kill something, a person, perhaps an animal, even a chicken, can I calm down. I'm sad that your majesty does not love me and terrified when you criticize me. All this turns to anger. Your majesty here refers to the king, his father. The female figure is never directly quoted, but Pseudo Apollodorus writes that she casts a spell upon the king, her husband, so that when he has sex with another woman, he ejaculates wild creatures into the woman's vagina, thereby killing her. Although the punishment is enacted on the body of the woman, this punishment is meant to deter the king from slaking his desires. Both figures are figures of excessive desire requiring containment. Both containers are wooden. Both containers are camouflage with a soft yielding substance, one with grass, one with fur. Both containers are ingenious solutions to seemingly intractable problems. One problem is political. One problem is sexual. They are both the same problem. They have the same solution. The male figure waits in the container for death to come. He waits for eight days. His son will live. This ensures a succession, the frictionless transfer of power. The female figure waits in the container for the generation of a life. We do not know how long she waits. Her son will die after waiting in his own wooden container. This ensures the, su the succession, the frictionless transfer of power. There are many artistic representations of both containers. The male figure's container is blockish, unadorned, a household object of standard size and quotidian function. Tourists climb into it and pose for photos, post them online. The cramped position of their bodies generates a combination of horror and glee. This in turn creates discomfort, the recognition that horror and glee should not be combined, that such a combination is taboo. The female figure's container is customized, lushly contoured. 
Its contours are excessively articulated to the same degree that her desire is excessively articulated. Artists depict the container in cutaway view, revealing the female figure within awaiting the wild creature. The abject position of the female figure on all fours, pressing her genitalia back against the hollow cow's genitalia, generates a combination of lust and revenge. This, in turn, creates discomfort. The recognition that lust and revenge should not be combined, that wild creatures and female figures should not be combined, that these combinations are taboo. <clears throat> the tourist can climb into the rice chest, the tourist can pose for a photo in the rice chest. Then the tourist can climb out of the rice chest and walk away. The artist can look into the hollow cow. The artist can render the contours of the hollow cow, the contours of the female figure. Then the artist can walk away. Both containers allow the tourist and artist to touch the hot button, the taboo. The desire and discomfort remain contained. Both containers allow the tourist and the artist to walk away. The male and figures, females, the male and female figures remain contained. Neither container, the rice chest, the hollow cow, appears to have any necessary connection to race. To mention race, where it is not necessary to mention race, is taboo. I have not mentioned the race of the tourist or the artist. The tourist and the artist are allowed to pass for white. The tourist and the artist are not contained. I have already mentioned the race of the poet, but to the extent that the poet is not contained, the poet is allowed to pass for white. I have already mentioned the race of the male and female figures. The male and female figures are contained. The rice chest and the hollow cow are containers. The rice chest and the hollow cow are not the only containers in this poem. Colchis and Korea are containers in this poem. Asianness is a container in this poem. Race is a container in this poem. Each of these containers contains desire and its satisfaction. Each of these containers contains discomfort and deterrence. Each of these containers contains a hot button, a taboo. The tourist and the artist can enter each of these containers. The tourist and the artist can touch the hot button and walk away. Each of these containers separates the slaking of desire from the punishment of desire. Each of these containers is an ingenious solution to a seemingly intractable problem. They are the same problem. They have the same solution. Each of these containers ensures the frictionless transfer of power. Each of these containers holds a male or female figure. The, the name of the male figure can be translated as, think of me in sadness. The name of the female figure can be translated as, I shine for all of you. Thank you.